because I want you guys as well as anybody who misses this class to be able to go back and look through recordings. Now, somebody did contact me yesterday because they were extremely confused about attendance and stuff like that. I forget if it was from this group or from another group I have. But the bottom line is on attendance, if you miss my morning lecture, if you miss this lesson, you have to listen to the recording. If you're in this lesson, okay, I get a report on that. You don't have to go listen to the recordings. Don't try to do both unless you really need to. Okay, so again, let's. I wanted to clear that up. You don't have to do both the recording and the morning lesson unless you want to hear everything again. Okay, EPA basically comes down to anybody who services, repairs, or disposes of any equipment containing a controlled refrigerant has to have in their possession a card certifying that you have obtained the proper level of certification to work that on the equipment you're working on. You cannot work under another person's certification. Now, as a hint, when you go through these, when we go through these PowerPoints and you see something that's highlighted like this, or something that's bolded, or something that's said like four or five times, okay, you have to realize that um, this is going to be on the examination. Okay, so again, just be aware that stuff like this that's highlighted and bolded is going to be on the examination. Okay, so you have to be personally certified. Distributors can only sell refrigerants to an EPA certified technician or a company that employs certified technicians. In other words, if you right now walk into your air conditioning supply house and try to buy refrigerant, they're not supposed to sell it to you. You are not currently certified. The first time you go in as a licensed or certified technician in whichever state you're in, the, the supply house is going to ask you to see the certification card. They're going to make a scan of it. They're going to keep it on file, and they'll probably, they'll probably want a copy of, like, your state license or if you don't have a state license, some other information to prove you are you. Okay, so they cannot sell you refrigerant without having that certification on file. Okay, there's four categories of the technician exam. You have type 1, you have type 2, you have type 3, and you have universal. Each category has 25 multiple choice questions. Okay? And there is no separate category for universal. All it means is that you've passed all of core, type 2, and type 3. Okay? You have to achieve a minimum passing score of 70% in each group. Okay? Which means 18 out of 25 correct. Type 1 is people who maintain service or repair small appliances has to be certified as either type 1 or universal technicians. Examples of this is water coolers, window air conditioners, refrigerators, freezers, dehumidifiers, ice machines, and what we call PTAC units. Those are the units you find like in hotel rooms and stuff like that. They are considered type 1 appliances. Type 2 appliances, okay? Type 2 is required for people who maintain, service, repair, or dispose of medium, high, and very high pressure appliances containing more than 5 pounds of refrigerant, or if the installation of such equipment requires refrigerant charging. You must be certified as type 2 or universal technicians. Now, there's a big difference here between type 1 and type 2. Okay, Type 1, the refrigerant is in the system, and it's factory sealed, and it's under 5 pounds of refrigerant. Again, type 1. 
refrigerant is in the system, it's factory sealed, and it's under 5 pounds of refrigerant. Type 2, more than 5 pounds of refrigerant or if the installation of such equipment requires refrigerant charging. In other words, if you have a system that only contains one pound of refrigerant, but you have to put it together and pipe it in the field, it's no longer a type one appliance. It's a type two appliance because you have to charge it. That is a major difference between the two types. Okay, type two, you have to charge it. Type three, we're going to have to spend a little bit more time talking about on Friday. Okay, type 3 technicians are people who maintain, service, repair, or dispose of low pressure appliances. Okay, they're certified as type 3 or universal technicians. Now, low pressure appliances, they run at refrigerant pressures of lower than 30 PSI at the liquid phase at a temperature of 104 degrees. Let me repeat that. Low pressure refrigerants have a pressure of 30 PSI or lower at a liquid temperature of 104 degrees. If that's in the liquid side, what do you think the evaporator side of this is with pressures. If my liquid side is only 30 PSI. They can go into a vacuum, can't they? Yes. That's why we have to have a separate conversation about type 3 appliances. Okay, so just be aware as we talk about type 3, the evaporator. Uh, what did you say the temperature was? 30 PSI? At, at 104 degrees. Again, the evaporator of type 3 appliances can be running in a vacuum. That's why we have to have a separate conversation about type 3 appliances. Contaminants, if there's a leak in a type 3 system, the leak and the water leaks into it, not out of it. Okay, so that's the important part about type 3. We'll, talk, we'll spend more time on that on Friday. Universal, all it says is you've passed type 1, type 2, and type 3. You're certified as a universal technician. Okay, I'm going to tell you that when a future employer looks at your resume, looks at your certifications, universal means a lot. Okay, this is a tough exam. Everybody knows it. Okay, universal means you just didn't learn from our four days of lecture. You actually learned the entire term, which brings up an interesting little thing that I need to tell you guys. If you pass and get your universal by the end of this course, which everybody here should be able to do, you do not need to take the written final for this course. Again, if you pass and get the universal, you do not need to take the written final exam for this course. You will still have a practical in the shop, but you will not take a written. Put everything you have into getting this course. I would rather not give anyone a written exam. The core contains 25 general knowledge questions. This is the core component regardless of type 1, type 2, or type 3, or universal, you have to pass the core. You cannot pass the other sections and get certified without passing the core. The core component take, contains 25 general knowledge questions. Okay, they're all relating to stratospheric ozone depletion. That's what we're really worried about. The rules and regulations of Clean Air Act, the Montreal Protocol, Refrigerant recovery, recycling and reclaiming, recovery devices, and substitute refrigerants and oil. We also talk about recovery techniques, dehydration, that's putting the system into a vacuum, recovery cylinders, safety, and shipping. A lot of this material I've already covered as a part of the course, so this is going to sound somewhat familiar to you. 
We're also worried about global warming potential with some of the newer refrigerants. Federal regulations require the test to be closed book and proctored. Okay, this is why we're going to have to schedule the exams into smaller groups. I can't just give you guys a link to the exam and say have at it because you have to be, we have to have cameras turned on in order to make this work. And I can't do 48 students in one Zoom session and make it work. So we're going Chris, to do it in smaller groups. There's a question about that. When are they going to start calling us to, to do the, the... Not until next week. you got okay. you got to get through this, okay? So end of this week or beginning of next week, you'll start hearing from the other instructors, okay? But they're basically waiting to make sure what day we can start this. If I go over... Friday, okay, and go into next week on the course material just to make sure everyone has it right. I don't want people to be scheduled to take an exam before I'm done with the material. Does that make sense, Alex? Center? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to schedule too fast. You guys have time, so if we need to take longer on it to make everyone understand it, I'd rather take the longer time. I'm fine with that. Quick question. Um, I know you said about the universal being a thing, and can we retake it, or how does that work if you make pass one type or two types and not one other? Do you have to go back and pass the other type or all of them? How does that work? No, you don't have to go retake all of them. As long as we get it done within, like, a 30-day period, you're okay. Um, what you will do is if by chance, and I don't want anyone to plan on this, guys, please plan on passing it the first time. But what you will do is you will get your score report back. It's instantaneous, okay? You get your score report back. If you do not achieve universal, let's say you pass type 1, you pass type 2, but you fail core and type 3, all you have to do is make an appointment with the same person that gave you the exam, the same proctor, okay, to retake just the portions you failed. Now, for the purpose of your final exam, I might, you will talk about it, but I will probably use the grades on your original, on your first try for exam grades. So get them, try to do it right the first time, okay? But um, you'll make an appointment, okay? Because you can retake it, I think, up to three times. Okay, and that changes from then to there. So try to pass it the first time. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Guys, there's something about psyching yourself out. I'm not sure if people have heard this before. Try to plan on passing it the first time. It just, you do, you'll do much better. Okay. Folks, when you're at, when you're scheduled to take your exam, okay, I'm going to have to see, or whoever is going to have to see a picture ID, okay? It is the way it is. We have to record the picture ID being shown. When you take your exam, okay, you're going to have to, on the secure exam website, you're going to have to enter your social security number, home mailing address, date of birth, phone number, email address. I don't care about that stuff, okay, from my perspective. But this gets registered with the federal government, and everybody knows they like to collect information. Okay, um, folks, if you don't know this information, please make sure you know it by the time you have your exam. Okay, you have a long weekend. If you need to contact parents, whoever, to get this information, especially Social Security number, make sure you have it. Make sure it's correct. If you are a foreign student who does not have a permanently assigned Social Security number, please contact me privately. It's important. And try to get in touch with me this week or, like, soon. Okay, again, let me say this. If you are an overseas student or a foreign student and do not have a Social Security number, I need you to contact me. And that's privately, not on a call, please. Okay, there are free EPA practice exams. I will give you the links. And again, as I said yesterday, these practice exams are a sample of exam questions. They get to get you used to taking an exam. There's only one set of questions out there. 
I have had students in the past who try to memorize those questions and get upset when they're not on the actual exams. So I'm asking you to please not do these practice exams until I tell you to do the practice exams. Okay, you're going to end up in a much better situation if you memorize those questions and think that that's going to be your exam questions. You're going to be sorely disappointed. The other thing that I'm telling you is that the exams that are currently on Quizlet.com and a few of these other practice exams or exam sites that people have um, put up there, they're old. These exams were all rewritten in the past year. Okay, so the stuff that's out on the Internet, it's good review material, but don't count on the questions being anything like that. Any questions on this so far? Okay, you guys have all seen this before. This is the vapor compression refrigerant cycle. By now, you guys should be able to tell me in detail what the refrigeration cycle is. Okay, all, most of my PowerPoints, most of everything we've gone through with refrigeration cycle show the refrigerant going in the same direction as this picture. Okay, the refrigerant worksheets you just did have it backwards, but it really doesn't matter because we know the compressor is the heart of the vapor compression cycle. Okay, again, let me say that again very carefully. The compressor is the heart of the vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Low pressure, low temperature, superheated refrigerant enters the compressor. It is compressed. It is changed to a high pressure, high temperature, superheated vapor. It then moves to the condenser where the heat is removed, desuperheating and condensing into a liquid. Before it leaves the condenser, the refrigerant is subcooled to a point below the liquid saturation temperature. It then flows to the metering device as a high pressure subcooled liquid. As the ref liquid refrigerant flows through the metering device, the liquid is reduced to a low pressure, causing a small percentage of liquid to flash to vapor. That's called flash gas. That lowers the remaining refrigerant to its saturation temperature. The low pressure, low temperature refrigerant flows into the evaporator as a low temperate liquid. As the refrigerant absorbs heat, it evaporates into a low temperature vapor. During this process, the refrigerant is superheated above its saturation temperature and then enters the suction line. From the suction line, refrigerant enters the compressor as a low pressure low temperature superheated vapor to repeat the cycle. The compressor and the metering device are the dividing points between the low pressure and high pressure sides of the system. So once again I'm going to ask you coming out of the metering device what is the state of that refrigerant? Gas. Anybody else? Saturated. It's a low temperature, low pressure liquid with some flash gas mixed in. It doesn't turn to gas until it starts absorbing heat in the evaporator and boils off. Okay, this is where that problem is where we've talked about it a few times coming out of the metering device. You're going to hear different people refer to it as different things. Some people are going to just say it's flash gas. Some people are going to say it's a low pressure liquid. But remember, it hasn't absorbed heat yet. Okay? It absorbs heat very quickly once it's in the evaporator. But coming out of the metering device, it's a low pressure liquid. Questions on that? Okay, flash gas is mixed into it. The compressor, 
What type of compressor is this? Is it a rotary compressor? Um, no, because there's valve cover. There's a valve cover right here. It's not a rotary. Okay, is it a hermetic compressor or is it a semi-hermetic compressor? Semi or is it an open semi. shaft? Hmm? I heard semi, and I'm okay with that. But there's, you see this shaft coming out on the side of it? There's a shaft um, right here coming out of it. You see this? This is an open shaft or an open drive compressor. You are correct that we could take it apart just as like what we would do with a semi-hermetic. But there's no motor in this compressor. The motor connects to, the drive motor connects to this shaft right here. Okay? So inside here, there's no motor or windings inside this main unit. Your motor and windings are separate from the unit. Okay, these are used in some pretty heavy commercial situa industrial and commercial situations. Now, as we go through here, you're going to hear me talk about shaft seals. There's a seal that seals the refrigerant into the compressor right here around the shaft. Okay, so I want, as we talk about it, as we go through this presentation, you're going to hear me talk about shaft seals. That is what they're referring to. It is where we have an open drive compressor, okay, and there's a seal that goes around that shaft that keeps the refrigerant in the compressor. Okay, so again, just to show you where that is. So a compressor takes low pressure, low and temperature, superheated vapor into it, discharges high pressure, high temperature, highly superheated vapor out of it. Does liquid go in or out of my compressor at any point? No. No. Guys, seriously, liquid does not belong in a compressor. I believe it or not, had this one student a couple terms ago fail their EPA exam because something on every part of that exam asked about liquid in a compressor, okay? And it was just enough for him to fail. So liquid does not belong in a compressor at any point in the process. Condenser. Three stages. Remember, guys, I asked you to memorize this in order when we started going over the condenser. I did it for a reason. Condensers, de-superheat, condenses, and subcools. Okay? Before it leaves the condenser, the liquid refrigerant is subcooled to a point below the liquid saturation temperature. Next, we have the metering device. High pressure, subcooled liquid comes into it. Low pressure, liquid, and flash gas come out of it. What's that third port on this metering device? What's the third port for? To open and close the different uh, valves. Nah, your manual adjustment is uh, down there. What is this third equalizer port? line? It's an equalizer line. Okay, it's used on evaporators where we have over a 2.5 PSI pressure drop. Okay, so if we have a large pressure drop, it's used on evaporators with a large pressure drop. Okay, but again, very, very important. Okay, we have to make sure that we know that low pressure liquid and flash gas come out of it. The evaporator, the inlet of the evaporator is a low pressure and temperature liquid with some flash gas. It heats up because it absorbs heat and because of the low pressures it boils off. 
coming out of the evaporator is a low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor. Okay, no liquid coming out of that evaporator. And then the cycle starts all over again. Now, there's a couple accessories shown in the basic diagram. You have two things that we haven't talked much about. We have a liquid receiver and we have a suction accumulator. Okay, they're really dependent on the type of system you're working on. In air conditioning, we do not see the liquid receiver that much. Okay, in air conditioning, we don't see the liquid receiver. All it is is a tank that stores liquid refrigerant and makes sure that the TXV or the meter device only gets liquid. That's simplifying it. Again, liquid receiver. All it is is a tank that stores liquid refrigerant, okay, and allows the liquid line and the metering device to get pure liquid. You can't have gas going to a metering device. Okay, suction accumulator. You see them on heat pump systems. Okay, suction accumulator. Most often, it's used on a heat pump system. The suction accumulator has one purpose. It's to prevent liquid from getting to the compressor. Okay. If you look closely at the suction accumulator, the suction line coming in, okay, comes down a little bit in this cylinder. The suction line going to the compressor comes off directly off the top of the cylinder. Any liquid refrigerant that happens to slide by from the evaporator will end up here in the accumulator and has to boil off before it can get to the compressor. You see them primarily in heat pump systems. Questions on those two parts? We also have service valves. Okay, a service valve is a three-part valve. The normal operating position for a service valve is called back seated. That's the position, that's the one that's in, currently in. Here's the valve stem that you're using a wrench on. You put a wrench on the end of that. The valve all the way out closes off your service port. That's where you connect the gauges. Okay? And leaves open a path for refrigerant between the compressor and the line. Everybody see that? Your service port is closed because this stopper is all the way up. Okay? It's back seated. The stem is all the way out. The service port is closed. The two line ports and the compressor port are open for the flow of refrigerant. Okay? What would happen if you closed that the whole way? Well, which whole way? Like that that valve stem goes in and stops into the line port area and stops the flow. Like, like that? that? Yeah. Okay. This is considered the front seated position. Your service port is now open to the compressor. But we've blocked off the line. Okay, depending on how this is operated, okay, and which side of the compressor this on, you can do some pretty severe compressor damage. You never operate the discharge side of the compressor. If the compressor has a service valve on it like this, you never put the discharge side into the front seated position while the compressor is running. Okay, that is an absolute. 
if this is on the discharge side of the compressor, and there are test questions on this, by the way, if this is on the discharge side of the compressor, you never operate the compressor with the service valve in the front seated position because it will actually break all the valves in the compressor. Okay, so when the valve is front seated, the line port is closed and the compressor port is open to the service port. Now why do we want to have a valve like this if we can't operate the compressor? What if you have a huge compressor and you want to re you want to service the valves and the um, seals inside the compressor, but you don't want to evacuate or recover 300 pounds of refrigerant. You can seal off the compressor from the rest of the system. You can just recover the compressor, the refrigerant out of the compressor, okay? Because the compressor and the service port are open. Okay, and you can isolate the compressor. You can do your repair work on the compressor, put the compressor into a vacuum, and then release the refrigerant back into the compressor. Okay, so the service ports allow you to isolate components to the system. Okay, so does this answer your front seated question? Yes, it did. Okay. The most often used position, other than the one that's backseated, which is your normal operation, the most often used position is the service valve in what's considered the crack position. I personally prefer mid-seated position. Okay? The service port is not front-seated and it's not back-seated. Okay? So, in other words, you open the valves usually by like just two turns. Okay? Your service port is open, so you're getting the pressure readings on your gauges. Your compressor port is open, and your line is open. So this is what you would do when you are actually taking pressure readings and servicing the equipment using your gauges. Okay, it's either, some people refer to it as the crack position, but it's also known as the mid-seated position. This position is for servicing and checking pressures. Okay, these three slides, back seated, front seated, cracked position or mid seated position, you have to know. Okay, there's only one way to know those, to memorize them. Gauge manifolds are considered one of the most important tools for an HVAC technician. Okay, the low side gauge is called a compound gauge. It measures low pressure and vacuum. Okay, the high pressure side is normally red. Not always, normally. The high pressure can be rated between 500 and 800 PSI. Okay. When you look at the low pressure side, Zero has some lines below it. That says it's in a vacuum. The retard section of the um, gauge basically protects the gauge. It's designed to prevent damage if you accidentally connect the low side gauge to the high pressure side of a system. Okay? It's there to prevent damage. If it wasn't there, the gauge would be, be broken if the pressures were too high. Okay, the high pressure gauge is normally red. Okay, inside each gauge, you may or may not have a temperature conversion right inside the gauge. Okay? If the refrigerant is not inside the gauge, you're going to have to use a temp pressure chart someplace. Atmospheric pressure is shown as zero PSI on the gauge. Depending on the refrigerant, the high pressure gauge could be rated at 500 PSI or 800 PSI. Most of our gauges are now rated up at the 800 PSI. An electronic manifold may have combined 
temperature probes to measure refrigerant line temperatures and they'll automatically calculate your subcool and superheat. You can actually switch refrigerant types right on the gauges and the temp pressure chart is built into the gauges. Some of the newer ones you can update via USB or Bluetooth and get the newer refrigerants right on there. Remember yesterday I was mentioning four port gauge manifolds? This is a four port gauge manifold. Your low pressure side is here. Your high pressure side is here. This is the port you'd use for refrigerant charging and this is a much larger line that you would use for your vacuum pump. Okay, this is a four port manifold gauge. The three port manifolds, which, I, which is what most of us use these days, okay, just doesn't have that extra large vacuum gauge. Okay, it's used to, doesn't have that large vacuum right there. I mean, it looks this, expensive. What was that? It looks expensive. Um, you know what? The electronic gauges have actually come down in price. The field piece, electro, field piece electronic gauges, okay, you can actually look up the pricing on these on Amazon. They're not that awful right now, okay. Um, I actually, I like my Testo probes, but I use the field piece for if I'm having to charge or recover refrigerant, I use a field piece manifold very close to this. Okay, and I don't think I, it's been a couple of years, but I think I paid like 250 bucks or something for them. They're not awful anymore. You can pay way more if you go like to the Testo version of this or to the, um, oh, what's the other big name? There's, there's another big name that I can never remember of these. But they're not that awful expensive anymore. You just have to look around. Do they sell them at like Home Depot? No. 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 No, it's it's something Amazon supplyhouse dot com um or your local supply houses, but before you're licensed, um it's tough to get things off of your local supply house. Um for those of you who have a Johnstone supply near you, it's a local it's a supply house chain. Okay. Um York, I think you have one someplace in York. I wasn't able to find it when I was there, but I think it's someplace in York. Uh, if not, I think it's in Lancaster. Um, for the guys in Chicopee, your closest one is in Worcester, downtown Worcester. By the way, that's the one we use to supply all of our campuses. So if you ever need something, you can talk to Brian. He's the branch manager at the downtown Worcester branch. Um, and I think I have people on this call from Hamden. I want to say that there's a Johnstone supply right near the Brainerd Airport area in Hartford. I think that's your closest one. So Johnstone supply is all over. If you tell them you're a Porter, Chester, or YTI student, depending on which institute you're with, they will, um, they'll work with you. They're decent on pricing, too. Okay. I like the digital manifolds. I would probably never go back to a gauge manifold set. That's just my opinion. EPA regulations require that the hoses be equipped with low-loss fittings. Now, some of you guys, when you were in shop, we had a conversation when I was up there for with you guys for a week. We had a conversation about low-loss fittings. We have to use low loss fittings okay those are those extra brass parts that we supply to you with your hose you have one for the low side one for the high side we give you a straight one and an angled one but low loss fittings can also come just as um, valves again it's a low loss fitting you're not going to lose all the refrigerant that's in your hose you're going to shut off the valve when you disconnect and you can pump your hoses down properly Low loss fittings are required. De minimis release, I've mentioned this a few times. There's, de minimis release is a minor release of refrigerant when connecting or disconnecting hoses for service or recovery. That's considered to be a de minimis release. 
Okay. Our whole purpose of EPA regulations of the Clean Air Act is to deal with the fact that some of the refrigerants on the market, some of the refrigerants we have used for years, have been shown scientifically to be reducing the ozone layer. Now that's a problem. So the core part of the exam not only covers the material we just talked about, but contains stratospheric ozone depletion, ozone depletion potential, talks about the Clean Air Act, talks about the Montreal Protocol, talks about the three R's, which we talked about yesterday, talks about recovery devices, talks about sales restrictions, talks about refrigerants and oils, talks about recovery techniques talks about leak detection, talks about dehydration, talks about recovery cylinders, talks about safety, talks about shipping and transporting. Okay. Question. What, what's uh, the Montreal Protocol and what is dehydration? We're going to talk about it. Glad you asked. Okay, dehydration is, dehydration is putting the system in a vacuum to remove all, um, all water and everything else from the system, all moisture. Okay, that's dehydration. Montreal Protocol is basically where this whole, this whole Clean Air Act and everything originated from. Countries got together in Montreal, came up with an agreement, is part of what it boils down to. So, the stratosphere is considered the Earth's security blanket. Okay, guys, I didn't write this, these slides, but the stratosphere is considered the Earth's security blanket. It's located between 7 and 30 miles above the sea level. The stratosphere is compi comprised of ozone and other gases. The introduction of CFCs, which was the chlorofluorocarbons, and HFCs, which is the hydrochlorofluorocarbons, those are the two initial types of refrigerants, have drastically changed the ozone layer. Okay, ASHRAE classification of refrigerant A1, which is the safest of most of our refrigerants, does not consider the environmental effects. When CFCs were introduced many years ago, they looked at safety of the handling of refrigerants. They had to be non-explosive and non-toxic to handle. Nobody looked at what the chlorine in these refrigerants, the chloro part of the refrigerants, would do to the ozone layer, which is part of the stratosphere. Okay, The ozone layer, we hear about this on the news every once in a while, is developing a hole at the North Pole. Okay? Um, Blue and purple colored areas, very low areas of ozone. Okay, this is on October 2004. There was a bigger hole recorded in 2006. Okay, which actually coincides and the levels of ozone have coincided with this whole idea of more and more people using air conditioning. So there was, a, there was a scientific study done, and I think it talks about further on. But our stratospheric ozone depletion basically is between 7 and 30 miles above the Earth is our stratosphere. Okay? There's four layers. Okay? The troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. Just know the stratosphere, okay? Their region, these regions do overlap in places. Okay, the stratosphere is part of the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, 7 to 30 miles above the Earth. This is the area we're very concerned about. Okay, the stratosphere ozone is a naturally occurring gas that filters out the sun's ultraviolet radiation. It's a shield. It protects us from the sun's UV rays. An ozone molecule consists of three oxygen atoms 
Wait a sec, something's in red on this slide. You think you might need to know this for the test? Again, I did not write these slides. They were written by the people who wrote the test. An ozone molecule consists of three oxygen atoms, O3. Okay? The UV radiation. Go ahead. Are we, are we going to be able to look at this again? Yeah, I was I trying put, to write I put these slides into the, they're in the module. And I will make this recording available. I put it on the modules for the day, okay? So the stratospheric ozone depletion, okay, is a combination of the chlorine in the refrigerant. Okay, the chlorine in the refrigerant starts attacking the ozone and breaks it down. Okay, so the UV radiation shears the sun or sears the chlorine atom from a CFC or HCFCFC model. The chlorine atom is then attached to an, is attracted to an ozone molecule. So again, we have refrigerant. This is a CFC, carbon fluorochloride. Okay, this is a this is a CFC module. Has chlorine in it. Has fluorine in it. Has carbon. The UV radiation from the sun removes the chlorine atom. The chlorine atom is then attracted to the ozone molecule. Stratospheric ozone depletion is a global issue. Again, wait a sec, something's underlined. It's a global issue. It can lead to problems such as crop loss, increases in eye disease, skin cancer, reduced marine life, deforestation, increased ground level ozone. Okay? How they test you on this material is they will give you this list. They'll toss something else on here and they'll say which is not a result of ozone depletion. Okay, so again, there's a multiple choice test. Okay, they're going to ask you which is not part of ozone depletion. So they're going to give you a bunch of stuff from this list and they'll toss something else in there. Okay. CFCs and HCFCs contain chlorine, which has been found in air samples taken from the stratosphere. When the CFCs and HCFCs are released into the atmosphere, the chlorine in them causes depletion of the ozone layer. Chlorine is the problem. Okay, you take your chlorine atom. You combine it with an ozone molecule. The chlorine steals one of the oxygen atoms, becomes chlorine monoxide. Then you have now a diatomic oxygen. Okay, That chlorine monoxide will collide with another ozone molecule release its oxygen atom, forming two O2 molecules, and leave the chlorine free to attack another ozone molecule. One chlorine atom can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules. This, I have yet to see an EPA exam where something on that was not on the exam. One chlorine atom can destroy up to 100,000 ozone molecules. Now, air samples taken from over erupting volcanoes show that volcanoes contribute only a small quantity of chlorine as compared to the CFCs and HCFCs. There's been a great deal of controversy over the subject of ozone depletion. What a shock. Some believe that chlorine found in the stratosphere comes from natural sources such as volcanic eruptions. However, air samples taken over erupting volcanoes 
leaks show that volcanoes contribute only a small quantity of chlorine as compared to the refrigerants containing chlorine. The rise in chlorine measured in the stratosphere matches the rise in the amount of fluorine, which has two different natural sources. Okay, over the past two decades, the rise in chlorine matches the rise in CFCs and HCFC emissions. Okay, the F in these refrigerant types of fluorine. So fluorine and chlorine has two has different natural sources. When they rise together, it points to the refrigerant emissions. The chlorine in CFCs and HCFCs will neither dissolve in water nor will it break down into compounds that dissolve in water so it does not rain out of the atmosphere. Naturally occurring chlorine will dissolve in water and rain out of the atmosphere. Let me repeat that. The chlorine in the CFCs and HCFCs will not dissolve in water, nor will it break down into compounds that dissolve in water. So it does not rain out of the atmosphere. Naturally occurring chlorine will dissolve in water and rain out of the atmosphere. Okay, pool chlorine is the naturally occurring type of chlorine. It will dissolve in water. The chlorine in refrigerants is different. Ozone depletion potential, ODP, is a measurement of a substance such as CFCs or HCFCs ability to destroy ozone. CFCs which is a refrigerant such as R12, has the highest ozone depletion potential. HCFCs are made up of hydrogen, fluorine, and carbon. Okay, HCFCs have a lower ozone depletion potential, but now we add a global warming potential. Okay, because we've dropped the chlorine, but I've added more carbon. Okay, so the globing warming, global warming potential is higher. So there's a trade-off. Greenhouse gases are stuff that warm the Earth in two ways. They absorb energy, slowing the rate at which it's escaped to space, and it acts like a blanket insulating the Earth. Okay. Examples of greenhouse gases okay, are stuff like carbon dioxide and other stuff like that. Okay. R744, carbon dioxide, CO2 is R744. It is a refrigerant. It's a natural gas. It's a very high pressure refrigerant. It has zero ozone depletion potential has no chlorine in it. It has a global warming potential of one. Okay, 744, carbon dioxide. It's an extremely high pressure refrigerant. Okay, your gauges, your gauge hoses will not handle carbon dioxide refrigerants, they'll burst. Okay, questions on that? What's that used for? It can be used basically in anything. Um, can be used in refrigeration most most of the time. Now it's used in refrigeration, like little un, in restaurant refrigeration where you have the under the counter units and stuff like that. Um, I've seen it in some soda machines. There's better refrigerants now, but this was a big thing when we were looking for replacements for R22 and um, R12. But okay, the problem with it, you need special but, gauges for that. Yeah, that's the problem with it. There's safety issues. Okay, if someone puts their regular set of gauges on a um, carbon dioxide system without knowing what they're getting into, 
Okay, you can have a really bad problem where someone gets either hurt or killed. Okay, you use gauge hoses that have metal fabric woven into them. Okay. Flammable refrigerants is the next big thing in refrigerants. They require a red color marking on all the process tubes. That's where refrigerants was pumped into the system at the factory. And any other pipe through which a flammable refrigerant passes and all the service connections. So if you walk up to a system and there's red color markings all over everything, it is a flammable refrigerant. The markings must extend one inch in both directions from any service location. If you have not been trained on flammable refrigerants, do not touch them. You guys have to have had hands-on training for flammable refrigerants. Now, right now, they're in very small quantities, but in the very near future, they're going to start being allowed on residential air conditioning systems. It's going to be a lot of flammable refrigerants around out there. Don't mess with them if you don't know what you're doing, but you'll see red color markings all over everything. It says it's flammable refrigerants. Okay. What was that? I said especially if you're a smoker. Yeah, probably not a good idea to smoke around these things. Okay. Propane is R290. It's not the same propane as you get for your grill. Okay, it's a purity it's a very pure version of propane. They take all the contaminants out of it. Okay? Propane purchased for grilling contains impurities which will damage refrigerant equipment. Propane and isobutane, which is R600A, are examples of A3 refri flammable refrigerants that do not require recovery. Let me repeat that. These flammable refrigerants that are pure propane or isobutane, they are A3 flammable refrigerants that do not require recovery. Question about that. Yes. Do, um, do they still add the, um, the additive to give it the gas smell? And then when it's in not, No, that's, a, that's what one of the impurities is. It's not, it has no odorant added to it. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, is that the same part. kind of propane they run like forklifts on? No, that that's more the grill type propane. They've added some additional stuff to that. Okay, the forklifts is basically the standard burning propane. This is a very pure version. If you have a if you have a propane leak on a forklift, you're going to smell it. Okay, if you have a propane leak on these refrigerant systems, you're not going to smell it. Now, if a flammable refrigerant is recovered, you have to use a special recovery machine. Okay, it has to be a ground explosion proof recovery machine. You cannot use your standard equipment on flammable refrigerants. Now, we say do not need to be recovered. So right now we're seeing these flammable refrigerants being used in smaller units. For example, the reach-in under the grill line in the restaurant. The air conditioner that might be in somebody's house of the window units. The refrigerator that might be in someone's kitchen is where we're starting to see these flammable refrigerants being used. So you're going on a commercial service call and you have to replace a TXV or metering device in a commercial kitchen where that unit is sitting next to the grill. Are you just going to let loose on the propane that's in that refrigerator? Probably not. Probably would be a very bad idea. Probably wouldn't want to do any brazing on a, a flammable system either. What, not what while there's refrigerant. Or... Yeah, not while there's refrigerant in it. That would be a bad idea. Okay. 
If I mention two things to you, upper explosion limit and lower explosion limit, can anybody tell me what that is? Anybody in here have had gas heating yet? The highest and lowest temperatures at which the combustible will explode. Can you change the temperature to air air gas mixture? Uh, no, I was guessing. Okay, you were close, but the temperature is, doesn't have anything to do with it. Upper explosive limit and lower explosive limit all has to do with the amount of gas and air mixture. Okay, so if I have a sealed refrigeration system that is 100% full of, of propane refrigerant and don't have any air mixed in with it, it's not going to burn. If I have a system with if I have a system that I've recovered the refrigerant out of and has some lingering refrigerant and there's too much air because there's not enough gas for explosion, it's not going to burn. Okay, so that's why propane systems are safe to operate because there's no air in them to cause that flammable to cause that combustion. Okay, again, if I've recovered the refrigerant out of it, and if I need to braze on it, I can do that once the refrigerant is recovered, okay, because I'm under my lower explosive limit. Okay, so again, upper explosive limit, lower explosive limit is a big thing about this. I'm assuming there's still an oil uh, in the yes. system. Yeah, you still have oil in it. Okay. Fluorinated gases, such as CFCs, HCFCs, and HFCs, are referred to high global warming potential gases, high GWP. Fluorinated gases, anything with the F in the center, okay, are considered high global warming potential gases, high GWP gases. Are 245FA, okay, is an HFC with an ODP of zero, but a global warming potential of 1,030 times greater than carbon dioxide. This is a low-pressure refrigerant used in commercial industries such as chillers and foams. We haven't talked about really these much either. We'll talk about more of this on Friday. Okay, it's a low pressure refrigerant, which means it runs 30 PSI and under in a liquid phase. Okay, 245 FA, 1,030 times greater than carbon dioxide. It replaced another refrigerant that had a very great ozone depletion potential, which was R11. Okay, so sometimes our replacements are solve the initial problem, but cause another one. R134A is an HFC with an ozone depletion lay level of zero but a global warming potential of 1430 times greater than carbon dioxide. It's a medium pressure refrigerant used in automotive, domestic, and commercial refrigeration, 134A. I'm going to tell you it's one of my favorite replacement refrigerants for any of the prior, the CFCs, in a, in a small commercial refrigeration environment. Okay, it's used in the automotive industry. Most of your cars have this in it now. Okay, it's a medium pressure refrigerant. HFC, okay, with ozone depletion of zero, global warming of 1,430 times greater than carbon dioxide. R410A, that's our primary refrigerant currently used in the air conditioning industry. R410A 
It's a high pressure refrigerant with an ozone depletion of zero and a global warming potential of 2,090 times greater than carbon dioxide. It's a near azeotropic refrigerant, we'll talk about that terminology, that does not fractionate during a phase change in the HVAC equipment. In other words, it doesn't have what we call a temperature glide. Okay, now, it has an ozone depletion of zero, but the global warming potential is relatively high, so we still have to recover this refrigerant. One of the biggest disadvantages of our 410A is the operating pressure is about 50% higher than R22. You can't just drop it in as a replacement to an existing R22 system. Okay, it cannot go into the existing systems. It will blow out the evaporator braze joints, and it will also probably blow out the compressor because the operating pressures are a lot higher. HFO, hydrofluoroolefin gases, HFOs. Okay, for example, R1234YF. It's a medium pressure HFO refrigerant with an ODP of zero, a global warming potential only four times greater than carbon dioxide. Okay, R1234ZE is basically the same gas, but it's meant for medium pressure for new chillers, heat pumps, and vending machines. 1233ZD is low pressure for new chillers and foam blowing. Okay, we can blow foam all over something we're trying to fast cool. Okay, and as the foam boils off, heats up, it cools the substance we're trying to cool. Okay, low pressure and medium pressure, HFOs, they are the newest thing in refrigerants because of the they, low... Uh, yeah. They use that R one that that one two three three Z D in like uh, power plants, nuclear reactors, don't they? You know, I don't know the exact answer to that. Maybe that one I can't answer for you. I can look. I, I think I, I think out. I did hear something that they use that as like an emergency, like an emergency system that sprays that on reactors to like. I can see cool it for the, on the foam side. I could see that because it would block the air and it would also cool. Yeah. I could see that, but I don't know that as a fact. So that one I have to look up. Okay. Refrigerant classifications, guys. You have to know this chart. You have to know this chart. This is the ASHRAE safety classifications. The safest refrigerants from a toxic standpoint is anything in the A column. They are not toxic to humans. The safest refrigerants from a flammability point of view is anything with the number one. So A1 is your safest refrigerant. Flammability, unlike prior versions of this, has four levels. You have no flammability. In other words, it ain't going to burn. You have 2L, which is slight flammability. This line was added from prior versions of this test and from the EPA material. Two is low flammability, and three is high flammability. So if you're ever working with a refrigerant that's a B3, don't do anything stupid. Okay, it's toxic and highly flammable. A1 is where most of our standard refrigerants have been. That doesn't mean you can sit there and inhale it. Okay? So again, A1 is our safest. B3 is our highly flammable, highly toxic. Okay, the Clean Air Act, Title VI, okay, is the federal law that sets up 
the Clean Air Act. Service technicians who violate the Clean Air Act may be fined, may lose their certification, and could be required to appear in federal court. The fine is steep. It's $44,539 per day per violation. Let me repeat that. The fine is steep. The technician or service company can be fined up to $44,539 per day per violation. Could you give examples of said violations that yeah, I mean, I can give you a perfect, Yeah, I can give you a perfect example. Um, a company in um, one of the towns outside Boston was bidding on a on a condominium replacement where they were going to have to replace um, 120 split systems. They were old units, R22, and they all needed to be upgraded. And the condo board wanted to do it all at one time. Okay, they went in with a bid along with several other companies. They did not get the job, okay, because they gave an honest bid. There was a low bidder who gave a ridiculously cheap number. Okay, there was no way this job was going to pay for itself. So the company that lost the bid wanted to know how they were going to do it. So they sat a technician out in the parking lot in his personal truck with a video camera. They captured on video a technician from the company that got the job showing up with a sawzall and just cutting the line sets on all 122 systems. Releasing the refrigerant. They turned the video over to the EPA as well as the local building department. The company got fined, along with the technician, $44,539 per system because it's per violation. Oh, somebody went out of business real fast. Yep. And the technician has never had never worked in the industry since. He lost his refrigerant certification. You cannot work in this industry without your refrigerant certifications. And because the technician got it in writing, he had a service slip, believe it or not, that told him exactly what to do. They subpoenaed the service records, okay, and he, the company lost their contractor's license and their business licenses. There's always somebody, watch. There's always somebody watching, especially in the days now. I have Nest cameras all over my house. If someone went up to my system and did that, okay, I'd have it on video without even trying, because the next camera's there. It's all over the place now. Don't do it. Okay? All you have to do is be caught and someone turns it in. Okay? The EPA occasionally may require technicians to demonstrate the ability to properly perform refrigerant recovery procedures. Failing to demonstrate these skills can result in revocation of certification. Technicians who do not follow the stricter state and local government requirements could have other penalties. EPA regs are the basis of a lot of other laws. State and jur local jurisdictions may impose regulations that are equal to or greater than those under EPA Section 608. Natural refrigerants, such as R744, that do not pose a threat to health or the environment, according to the EPA, can just be released. Okay, carbon dioxide, it's in the air around you, it can just be released. Now, where would you find that used in a system? Soda machines right now are very heavy usage of carbon dioxide. Again, that's that high-pressure refrigerant that, it, that you can't use your standard gauges on. 
Okay, now, can I, can a local building official tell a technician that they don't have to recover the refrigerant out of an R22 system? No. No. Again, the local jurisdiction can only make it tougher, not easier. It's in violation of Section 608 to falsify or not keep required records. It's in violation to fail to reach required evacuation levels. That's basically a recovery. Recovery and evacuation are interchangeable terms. Prior to opening or disposing of an appliance. It's in violation to knowingly release ozone depleting and substitute refrigerants such as CFCs, HCFCs, or HFCs while maintaining, installing, repairing, or disposing of appliances or industrial or process refrigeration, with the exception of a de minimis release. De minimis release when you're taking your hose on an office system. Okay, don't do it. De minimis is a small or minimal. It doesn't matter, and the law doesn't take it into consideration. De minimis release. Disconnecting refrigerant hoses, you get a little bit of refrigerant, nothing you can do about it. Hey, I learned about that last night. <laughs> cool. Was there a de minimis release or a major release? De minimis. It was just a little bit, not much yeah. at all. And he was saying, he's like, that's what it, That's what the de minimis, the, uh, you know what, I can't speak yeah. right now. Yeah. Don't worry, it takes me a while to say it too. Okay. It's in violation of Section 608 to service, maintain, or dispose of appliances without being properly certified. You also have to recover regulated refrigerants before opening and disposing of an appliance. You have to have an EPA-approved recovery device equipped with low-loss fittings that automatically close or have manually operated shutoff valves on the hoses. You cannot add nitrogen to a fully charged system for the purpose of leak detection, thereby causing the release of the mixture. It used to be people back when, back in the dark ages, used to add nitrogen into the system, saying, oh, I'm using it to leak check, and then they could just discharge the refrigerant less than the system. It, they were able to avoid recovery because they were using nitrogen for leak checking. You can't recover nitrogen. Okay? It, you cannot do that anymore. You have to, you cannot dispose of a disposable cylinder without first recovering it to zero PSI. Okay? You cannot release refrigerant during vandalism or theft of any HVAC equipment. If the local cops can't charge you with it, the federal government can. That was added just recently, surprisingly enough. That was one of the most recent changes. Okay? It is the responsibility of the final person in the disposal chain to ensure that refrigerant has been removed from an appliance before scrapping it. Okay, in other words... If you, as a, if you as a technician bring it back to the contractor shop and, uh, and the trash is going to pick it up from there, okay, it goes in the dumpster and the trash guy picks it up from there, it's your responsibility to make sure that refrigerant has been recovered. Technicians disposing of appliances with 5 to 50 pounds of refrigerant have to keep the following records. They have to keep the location, date of recovery, okay, for each disposed appliance, the quantity of refrigerant recovered in each calendar month, and the quantity of refrigerant type transferred for reclamation or destruction, and the person who it was transferred to, and the date of the transfer. That's why we keep paper records, okay? Folks, tomorrow I'm going to start off from the slide that says the Montreal Protocol, Okay, I think 60 slides in one day is enough, and that's where we're going to stop for today. Anybody have any questions for me?